Well, again, good evening. Good to see everyone tonight. Everybody's had a great afternoon. We're going to finish our Sunday in God's Word, and we have made it to Genesis 48. We're going to finish this book before too long. I've entitled Genesis 48, Facing the End, because here we find Jacob at 147 years old, now coming to the end of his life on this earth. As we've seen, he spent the last 17 years of his life in Egypt, making that move from Canaan. But now it's time for him to make his greatest move. Now, we know this wasn't the end of Jacob, as if Jacob was never going to exist again. Rather, we recognize this was just a move for Jacob from this life to the next, as it is for every person who puts their faith in the Lord. Death is just the beginning, really, of true life. This would simply be the end of, of Jacob's life in this realm. This would be the end of his opportunity to make a difference in the here and now. And even though seeing the final stages of a person's life before their physical body comes to an end is sad, because you're seeing this person who was once very vibrant, once very strong, now very weak, having moved so far from where they once were, and it, it's sad. To, to watch that process in those that we love. But with that, there are great lessons, even during that very difficult season, that we can learn from watching a person's life as they prepare to move from this realm to the next. I remember with my own grandmother, who knew in advance, she had what a lot of people don't have, she had the knowledge that her days were, were coming to an end. And, and how valuable it was just to watch her life and, and listen to her words during that time. It revealed so much about her. I mean, I remember especially to hear her as the, the family had, had gathered what would be the last Easter lunch we would celebrate together. And she was weak by this point and couldn't speak very strongly. But after finally getting everybody kind of quieted down, she spoke and, and talked about how glad she was to see us all having a good time. And, and then she said her desire is that she would see all of us in heaven one day. I mean, that spoke volumes about the priority of her life. And it spoke volumes to us as her family about what should be our priority as well. And that's exactly what Jacob's life does for us here in Genesis 48. As we see him conduct himself, as we see how he operates with the knowledge that his time is very short. And so this chapter reveals to us what was in his life, what was in his heart, what his priorities were. And it is such a witness to us of what we should desire for our own lives, what we should seek the Lord to have found in our lives when it comes to the end of our days. And so as we go through this, we're going to lift out some of these actions from Jacob's life. And I'm asking that the Spirit will, will hopefully apply it to our hearts tonight as well. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Father, again, we thank you for your word, Lord. And I know that we're all at different stages in life. Some of us or just to statistics are, are, are closer to preparing to leave this world than others. But Lord, wherever we're at tonight, God, as we look at the life of Jacob, may we learn valuable principles from his life about how we should be preparing, how we want to end our days, Lord, in a way that honors you and it's a blessing to others. So, so use this, God, to speak to our hearts tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Verse one, Genesis 48 now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now that message that comes to Joseph, your father is sick, we understand that means more than he had a cold. Right? The, the idea is he's dying. He, he's not going to recover from this. The end is near. And in hearing this, Joseph immediately takes his two sons with him to go see dad. I just think what Joseph would have missed out if he hadn't have gone at this moment. I mean, knowing the story, right? we can read ahead, we know what, what's going to happen, what he would have missed out on. Joseph missed out on 22 years with his dad because of being sold into slavery by his brothers. But the Lord now gives him a, a special opportunity to have time with Jacob at the end. And Joseph is not going to miss this opportunity, and it's going to be an incredible blessing for him and his sons. Verse 2 says, And Jacob was told, 
Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Now, as we look at these actions in in Jacob's life, we can be very confident that these are a good example for us. I believe simply from the fact that in verse 2, mid-verse, we have a name shift. That the Holy Spirit leads Moses in penning this to say when Jacob was told that then Israel strengthened himself. Jacob is going to act according to God's ways at this moment. Not in the flesh, as we often see, but now in the spirit. And I submit to you, here's the first thing to note about Jacob as he was preparing for the end. That is, he wanted to use the strength he had for others. He could have just wallowed in his current state. I mean, again, he's 147 years old. He's he's sick. He hears Joseph is coming. He could have just pulled the covers up over his head, right, and said, leave me alone. And no one would have probably blamed him for that. But we see he had something he wanted to communicate. He, there's something he wanted to, to do, something he wanted to pass on. He wanted to use this opportunity, as we're going to see, to be other-centered rather than being self-centered. And so it says he strengthened himself. But you think about it, it would have taken a whole lot of effort. Right? Probably caused a whole lot of pain for him to be able to get himself up in his bed. We're going to learn in a moment that he even had to, to lean upon his staff. But he did this in order to minister to his son. So again, even in this state, we see Jacob was looking to give, not just to get. And here's what's fascinating about all this. It's this event from Jacob's life. All that he went through, all that we read about, but it's this event that gets recorded for us in Hebrews 11. And you remember the significance of Hebrews 11, right? That's the, what we call the Hall of Faith chapter. That, that's the great saints of the Old Testament and what they did that set them apart as men and women of faith. And it's this event in Genesis 48 that Jacob's life is identified with in that list. Not when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, not his experience at Bethel when the angels were coming you know, up and down the, the ladder, but the blessing of Joseph's sons at the end of his life. Hebrews 11:21 puts it like this. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of of his staff. It's this very moment we're reading up here that the New Testament holds up as the apex of Jacob's faith and confidence in God. And knowing that, realizing that, I think really should, should open our eyes, really cause us to, to look at t- intently into this chapter, into the words, into the actions of this chapter that really set Joseph's life apart. And we'll touch more on this specific aspect of faith as, as we get to the end. Verse 3, then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And so Jacob begins to reminisce about his time in Luz. Luz was also called Bethel. That may ring a few more bells. You remember the story. Jacob remembering back to the first time he he encountered the Lord personally. Remember, he deceived his father, pretending to be Esau. Mom says, you better get out of here. Your brother's ready to to murder you. And so he heads off to Rachel's family in Padanaram. Along the way, he stops to spend the night. He didn't even have a pillow. Didn't have mypillow.com back then. So he took a rock laid his head on that rock. And that night is when he had that dream of angels descending, ascending from heaven to the earth. And the Lord revealed himself to Jacob, gave Jacob these promises that he reiterates here, the same promises the Lord made to his grandfather Abraham, the same promises the Lord made to his father Isaac, he gives to Jacob. The promise of a great people that would come through Jacob's descendants, the promise of a great nation that would end up blessing all the nations of the world and the the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. One person put it like this. It was a promise of people, population, and place. And God said, I'm going to do it through you, Jacob. 
And Jacob here at the end of his life, he goes back to the beginning of his relationship with God and he declares how the Lord's blessings had been upon him. And I believe it's another place for us to, to pause and take note. As we see Jacob facing the end of his life, we see Jacob focused on the blessings and not the burdens from his past. You think about all we've read about Jacob. He had a lot to complain about. He had a lot to bemoan about. How Laban had treated him all those years and taken the love of his life and switched her with her sister there at the altar. After Jacob had worked seven years for her and then he had to work another seven years to be able to marry Rachel. How Laban continually changed his wages over and over. How he was robbed 22 years of time with his son Joseph thinking he was dead. All that Jacob had to look back on how he was treated and the difficulties of life and things he missed out on. But the first words out of his mouth aren't all the bad things that had happened to him. Not all the things he'd missed out on but how God had blessed him and given him these great promises. That's what he was focused on as his time was coming to an end. But we also notice that jo Jacob didn't take these blessings in a selfish way. But in view of these blessings he had received, we see now he wanted to in turn be a blessing to others. And so notice verse 5. And now, Jacob says, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, who you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. That's what Jacob's doing here. Jacob's heart was to adopt Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, as his own. No longer are these boys going to call Jacob grandpa. Now they're going to call him dad, which means they're going to have the right to the inheritance just like all of other of Jacob's sons. As he says here, they're going to be just like Reuben, just like Simeon, and the ten others. Now Jacob says, Joseph, any other kids you have? Hey, they're, they're yours. But these two, they're mine. I'm taking them. In essence, through them, Joseph was going to be getting the double portion of the birthright. Remember the birthright we've talked about. Usually the oldest son got a double share of the, of the financial blessings. But remember, Reuben had forfeited that as the oldest through his immoral actions. Now it was essentially being given to Joseph through his two sons. Now, now note this. Even though the physical blessing, the financial blessing would go through Joseph's line, it's interesting the leadership of the family. The name wouldn't go through Joseph's line. The name, the leadership of the family, would go through the line of Judah. He would be the line of the Messiah. So it's very unique here. The two different lines usually both went through the, through the oldest, now go through two different sons of Jacob. But understanding this adoption, it really kind of helps us when we're reading on through the Old Testament and, and we read the different listings of the 12 tribes. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when you read through the Old Testament, you read the 12 tribes of Israel, almost none of those listings are the same. They're, they're different. And the reason for that is because technically there were 13 sons of Israel. Joseph, since he gets replaced by his two sons. So there were 13 sons. I read there are more than 20 different listings of the, of the tribes throughout the Old Testament. And this helps explain some of that. Now, we say, well, when they divide the land, they divide it among the 12 tribes. And that's true. Because remember, the tribe of Levi, through which the priests came, they weren't given an allotment in the land. Remember, God said, I will be your inheritance. And so the 12 were given... Levi was left out. But in the midst of all of that, again, I draw you back to this attitude of Jacob that just stands out. And here at the end of his life, his desire is to bless others, to bring them into the blessing he'd been brought into, his heart's to give. He could have just been consumed with all he was going to lose once he died, all he was going to leave behind. But instead, he was focused on blessing others. Now, of course, these two boys would have had a special place, we know, in Jacob's heart because they were grandsons of his beloved 
wife, Rachel. And that's exactly to who his thoughts turn in verse 7. He said, but as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob shows us something here, and we're going to see more of it in a moment. But he shows us what's so often the case when people come to the end of their life. And that is, it's not their accomplishments, it's not their achievements that matter that they're thinking back upon, but rather their relationships, the people that they loved. That's what means the most to them. And again, that's where Jacob's mind goes. In verse 8, then Israel saw Joseph's sons, and he said, who are these? Now that kind of cracks us up. (laughs) He's just talking about these guys, and they're standing in the room, and he has no clue who they are. You're like, this, guy, this guy's losing his mind. He is 147 years old. Actually, he's not losing his mind. Actually, he was losing his eyesight. And we're going to see that in a moment. He's, he's becoming a lot like his dad Isaac was at the end of his days. He, he knows there's a couple of fuzzy figures in the room with, with Joseph. He just quite can't make out who they were. So verse 9, Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will Bless them. This takes us back, doesn't it, to when Jacob received the blessing from his father. And you just have to wonder if this moment, if, if, if Jacob didn't have a flashback in his mind. So that day he stood before his father to receive the blessing of the family. Only when he received it, it was through deception. Right? Isaac said, who are you? He said, oh, I'm, I'm Esau, right? right? As he was dressed in his clothes and he, you know, he stuck goat hair all over his body, trying to look like Chewbacca to fool his dad, to trick him right, into thinking that he was the oldest. Had mom, you know, make supper and bring it in. It was all in deception in that moment as he received that blessing. But here Joseph is answering. He's acting in honesty. He's kind of redeeming what had taken place with his dad. Verse 10, now the eyes of Israel were dim with age. Here's why we see that he couldn't recognize who was in the room, so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. And I never thought I'd even see you again, Joseph. I thought we were done. I thought 17 years old, that's the last time I would ever be able to have a conversation with you, talk with you. But not only have I been able to see you, not only has God brought you back into my life, I have gotten to see your children. And again, what do we see in, in Jacob in his final moments? We see a priority for relationships. What matters to Joseph or to Jacob? that he's gotten to be with his family, that he's gotten to see those that he loved. That's what was valuable to him. Not again, not all the flocks he had, not all the deals he had brokered. What he's thankful for are the people in his life. And I think seeing this should really impress upon our hearts the importance of investing in the relationships we have, to not take them for granted, but to treasure them now, to, to make them a priority now. And this is what was on Jacob's heart at the end. Verse 12 says, So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, that is from beside Jacob's knees. These boys don't don't think of them as little kids. They're probably in their 20s. And he bowed down with his face to the earth. This jumps out to me. Joseph is the second most powerful man in the world. In the world, Egypt being the, the, the superpower of the day. And yet, this mighty man is still honoring his father by bowing before him, humbling himself in acknowledgement of this great blessing upon his sons. And now Joseph is going to again help his dad out a little bit to carry out this, this blessing, or at least so he thinks he's helping. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, And he brought them near him. 
Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, now check out what happens here. Remember, in this culture, we talked about this many times in, in Genesis, the oldest received the greater blessing. So Joseph, knowing his dad, obviously can't see very well. He's already proven that. The boys were standing in front of him, and he had no clue. Right? He obviously needs a little help. So Joseph positions the boys where the oldest is going to be in front of Jacob's right hand, and the youngest, Ephraim, is going to be in front of Jacob's left hand. And as you know, again, we've talked about the right hand was considered the, the favored position. Again, I apologize to all of you left-handed people out there. Just the way it is. That's why Scripture says Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, right? the, the place of favored position. But notice what happens. When, when Jacob goes to lay hands on the boys to enact the blessing, he crosses his hands. It was, it was, it was a crossover. And he puts his right hand of favor upon the younger Ephraim and his left hand on the older Manasseh. Now, again, we read this and we think, oh, poor guy, he's not only blind, he's lost all coordination, right? He can't even get his arms to, to work right. But the text tells us something very important. It tells us this wasn't a mix-up. The end of verse 14 tells us Jacob was guiding his hands knowingly. He knew exactly what he was doing because he was doing exactly what the Spirit of God was guiding him to do. He was giving the greater blessing to the younger. And here, I believe, is another mark of Jacob's life we see at the end of his days. Though he was physically weak, he was still spiritually perceptive. No, you know, his physical body didn't work very well. He couldn't see. He was bedridden. It was all he could do to even sit up in bed. His body was shutting down, but his spirit was still in tune with the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was still able to discern God's work in his life. His spiritual senses were, were still very strong. And not only that, he was open and submissive to the Spirit's work. And what a beautiful thing we see here in, in Jacob's life. And I think what a, what a quality to have in, in, in our own lives as we see the physical part of us growing weaker and weaker. What a reminder this is of what Paul spoke in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That this is what matters. That our spirit's growing stronger and can grow stronger and still in tune with the spirit, even in a physical state like this. And after placing his hands where he wanted them placed, now Joseph blesses the sons. Now Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph, verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, and again, Joseph was being blessed in the sense his sons were blessed. God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, and the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So as Jacob declares this blessing over Ephraim and Manasseh, notice what he acknowledges about the God he's asking to bless their lives. I think it's very telling about, about Jacob, how he describes the God that he seeks to, to have bless his sons. He, first of all, in verse 15, refers to God as the one who fed me all my life long to this day. More literally, that translates the God who has shepherded me. And this is actually the first mention in the scripture of God as a shepherd. A description we know that will be used many, many times over from this point. And of course, Jacob himself was a shepherd. I think it makes his language even more meaningful. Jacob knew the care that it took. Just as Michaela prayed. He knew the care that it took to watch over sheep how sheep want to go their own way, and how you have to constantly put sheep in a place to eat. Right? you got to put them in front of water. you got to make sure they get where they need to be. That on, on their own, they'll die. They'll starve to death. And that's how he compares God's work 
in his life. Here he is facing the end, and yet Jacob is acknowledging his sustenance over all these years was not by his works. It wasn't by his production. Rather, it was by God's provision. Because Jacob could have been reminiscing about how he so craftily worked all his plans, right? He could have gone back to how, how wise and smart he was when he had all those spotted sheep drink the water with the bark of the tree, with the branches peeled back, and how they, they began producing strong, healthy babies, and then he took those strong, healthy babies and he mated them with each other and, and created this incredible herd, this incredible flock that he was able to take out of Panamaram away from, from Laban. He could have started going through all of his agricultural you know, you know, genius. He could have gone through his abilities, what he had produced. But instead, looking back, he's acknowledging that the reason he was cared for, the reason that he had what he needed wasn't about him. It was about the God who had fed him and taken care of him and led him and provided for him. And we know Jacob was anything but lazy. I mean, Jacob was a very hard-working man. But amazingly, as he looks back at the end of, of, of the day, it's God he recognizes was ultimately the one who gave him all that he had. And secondly, he declares in this, and knowing it was God his provider, but also God was his protector. He, he said there in verse 16, describing the Lord, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Again, he's not boasting in his ability to overcome all the evil that had been done to him in the past. All that Laban had tried to do in taking advantage of him and then tried to come after him after you know, Jacob took the family and, and, and tried to get away in the middle of the night. No, he's acknowledging it was God who got him out of these things. He, he's acknowledging it was God who, who came to Laban in that dream and said, you better not lift a finger against my servant. At the end of his days, Jacob is focused solely on the faithfulness of his God. Now, I also have to wonder if Jacob, in this statement about the angel who's redeemed me from all evil, I just wonder if he also had in mind not only God's deliverance from the evil that was done to him, but you just also wonder if he also had in mind God's deliverance from the evil that was within him. The God who had redeemed him from that inward evil. And what I'm thinking of is the time we read about when Jacob, as the scripture said, this man or this angel, capital A, this messenger from God, met Jacob at WrestleMania 1. You remember it. There by the, the Brook Jabbok when they grabbed hold of each other and this wrestling match took place. When, when a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus broke the pride of Jacob and humbled him and left him with that wound in his hip. And Jacob in that moment began to realize how dependent he was upon the Lord, how much he needed the Lord's blessing in his life, how Jacob was dealt with and how he was redeemed from the evil that was in his heart. Finally understanding his need to consecrate himself. Maybe that's a part of what Jacob had in mind. And if he, if he did... I think it shows a valuable truth. What Jacob is saying here is that one of the worst moments in his life actually turned out to be one of the greatest moments in his life. And I think for many of us, that can probably be said. Maybe it can't be said right now. We're going through the difficult part. But one day, like Jacob, we may be able to look back and see this very crippling thing that happened in our life, this horrible moment has become the very thing that God used to make us more like him, to redeem us of our flesh and our sinful nature, to break us so that we'd be more like him. And it's in this God, the God who had provided, the God who had protected Jacob, that he blesses these sons of Joseph and prays that God's name would be upon them, that they would grow. Well, at this, notice Joseph's response. Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, right, the younger, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. 
And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Joseph gets a little frustrated with his dad. That is not how it's supposed to go. Dad, I know you're losing it, right? I'm serious. I'm trying to be patient here. Let me help you out. And so he's switching hands and moving him around. And I love Jacob's response. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people. He also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. I see another very noteworthy mark in Jacob's life as he was coming to the end, and that's his response here to Joseph. To know even at the end, Jacob was willing to lead his family. He was willing to do the right thing, even though it may have not been the popular thing. This isn't how Joseph wanted things done. And Jacob, considering the fact he'd missed out on all these years with Joseph, he could have very easily given in and thought, you know what? I don't want Joseph upset with me. I'm about to leave this world. I don't want it to be turmoil in the family. I want to make sure everybody's getting along. Everybody's happy. And so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give in to what he wants. I'll give the greater blessing to, to Manasseh. But he didn't do that. Now, we've seen many a times how Jacob didn't lead his family rightly. But note, here at the end, he's doing just that. He's leading them in God's plan for what's right rather than what Joseph thought was best. Again, no, no, Joseph had right intentions here. It wasn't he had an evil heart, but he was wrong. He didn't understand what needed to be done. Jacob did. And even though it meant saying no to his son, his favored son in this moment, he stood with that. He went with that. Now, obviously, I've never been there, but I imagine there is probably a real temptation when you're at the end to want to just give in to the desires of those around you. Make everybody happy in your family. Keep everybody on your, on your side. I think this had to be a very real temptation, but again, Joseph stands his ground for what the Lord had obviously revealed to him. No, Ephraim, the younger, he's to have the greater blessing. Manasseh is going to be taken care of, but Ephraim is to have the greater blessing because he will be the greater people. And again, we know this wasn't just Jacob being ornery. It wasn't just trying to push his agenda. We know this was of the Lord because we see how prophetic it was. Ephraim would become the greater nation. In fact, you read through the Old Testament, and many times after the nation of Israel split and the ten tribes up north and then the two tribes down south, Many times those 10 tribes up north, they were sometimes referred to as Israel, but many times they were referred to as Ephraim to describe them all because of the greatness of this, of this tribe. Jacob acting very prophetically here, even though it didn't make sense to Joseph. And of course, by this point in Genesis, we know this reversing of the normal pattern of the firstborn, that doesn't shock us. Abraham chooses Isaac, rather than Ishmael. Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob, rather than Esau. And here we see Jacob, not only doesn't give it to Reuben, but he gives it to Joseph's sons, and at that, the youngest son and not the oldest. And he won't stop here in Genesis. When it comes time to pick the king of Israel, the, the king God wants, it's not the oldest son of Jesse that's chosen. It's the youngest son. It's David. God loves going against convention. God loves working against the, the normal way culture says things are to, to go. Because as the Lord had to explain to the prophet Samuel, man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. God has a totally different set of values and priorities that he cares about. The world said this is what matters. This is what should be honored. This is what should be exalted. And God comes along and turns that on its head. In his kingdom, Jesus said, it's the least. It's the last in the eyes of this world. That's the first. And it confronts us, if we're going to live with the mind of Christ, we need to make sure we have these right priorities as well. And so Jacob stands his ground, and to Joseph's credit, he submits. Verse 20, so he blessed them that day, saying, by you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before 
Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Notice that phrase at the beginning of verse 21. I am dying, but God. It's not, I'm dying, guys, and I'm sorry it's all over. <laughs> sorry there's nothing left. I hope you guys make it. I've tried to do my best for you. I'm not going to be here to help you anymore. I know it's going to be hard. I don't know how you're going to make it. <laughs> I'm dying. God's failed. I thought he would do more. He hasn't done it. No, Jacob's dying, but he's dying with great faith. I may be leaving you. I won't be around, but God's not done. His work, his plan, his power is going to continue right on. What incredible truth and understanding to have and to be able to pass on to others when we come to the end of our days. And again, this is ultimately why the writer of Hebrews chooses this moment to lift up Jacob in. He passed the blessing onto Joseph's sons because he believed God's work wasn't done. No, Jacob didn't get to see the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham and made to Isaac. God had been promising it for a long time, right? It's about time, God. If you're going to do it, you should probably do it through me. He gets to the end of his life. He's, it's, it's not done. He didn't just throw in a towel and say, I guess, I guess we all missed it. I guess God messed up. No, he's leaving this world but still believing, though he hasn't seen it. In fact, he's even out of the land where part of the promise is to happen, and yet he's still believing the promise is true. Still believing God would do it. God will establish them in the land of Canaan and ultimately, and more importantly, believing that he would provide them the promised one who would redeem the world from the curse that began way back in Genesis 3. Still believing that one day the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So here he is at the end of his life, still having faith in his God, coming to the end still full of hope. Again, not wishful thinking, I hope this works out but absolute confidence in the word of God. As we've seen, Jacob's faith was all over the place throughout his life. I mean, this guy was a roller coaster. But here at the end, this guy, he nails it. And he even adds this, verse 22, Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. And he's speaking here of the portion of the land that would go to each of his, of his sons one day. Jacob has now fathered two tribes and the fact that Ephraim and Manasseh have been adopted in, so he's going to get one more portion than, than the rest of his brothers in the land of Canaan. A portion we learn here that Jacob had acquired while he was still in the land, and we have no record of him taking this portion of land by this military combat. We read of him buying a piece of land but obviously at some point maybe after he bought it maybe he had to stand his ground maybe he had to, to fight off the enemy but he had secured this land and it was going to go now to Joseph and actually this word portion there in verse 22 is kind of a play on words in the Hebrew it's actually the word Shechem which is very interesting because that would be the very city that would be among Joseph's inheritance and it would be the very city where Joseph's bones would be taken and buried in. Incredible faith that Jacob had of what God would do. And we're going to see Jacob have some more words for the rest of, of his sons as God's going to give him more prophetic insight into their lives, into their, into their future before he breathes his last. But just pausing here, what an example Jacob gives us, again, as he nears the end of his life in this realm, Again, what an example I think we should be praying to be found in us when our days draw to a close. I mean, to see a man here using his last strength for others, a man focused on the blessings and not the burdens of his life, desiring to pass these blessings on to others, a man who, though physically weak, was still spiritually per perceptive, a man who recognized his sustenance wasn't due to his production, what he'd accomplished, but God's provision and God's protection. And a man who even in his final moments was leading his family in what was right and who knew that even though he had come to the end, he continued to walk by faith in God's promises and encouraging his family to continue to do the same. 
That's quite a list of qualities. When you consider how easy it is when your time comes to get self-focused, right? to get grumpy, to get negative, to get spiritually lazy. And yet, here's Joseph, Jacob, showing us a much different way. Again, we've pointed out many times throughout Jacob's life, there are many things you can learn from Jacob's life what not to do. Here's how you don't want to live. But again, here at the end, his final stages, there's so much from his life about what we should do. So much, again, that I think challenges us and what we should want to be found in our lives as we face the end of our days. And so let's pray and let's ask the Lord to work these principles in Jacob's life into ours tonight. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the lives that you present to us in your word. Men who were just like us in every way. Lord, but who just simply followed you. And just see Jacob's life, though it was a roller coaster, he, he never threw in the towel. And again, here at the end, even though it took 147 years, what a testimony his life is. God, and that's what we want our lives to be. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful with us just like you were faithful with Jacob. And Father, I know that the thought of the end is, can seem so far away, Lord, but what we're building in our lives now is preparing us for how we conduct ourselves at the end. And so, Father, I just pray that you take these truths in whatever stage of life we are tonight and you would apply them to us. Lord, speak them to our heart. Challenge our hearts tonight where we need to hear these things, where we need to be convicted, motivated, encouraged by the example of Jacob. And again, Lord, we thank you've given us these things. And by your spirit, Lord, would you work them in us. Lord, we love you. God, we want to be people of faith. That no matter what happens to us in this realm, Lord, we know that you are going to continue on. You have a plan. You have a purpose. And so as we leave tonight, Lord, we just want to leave declaring our faith in you, our trust in you. Lord, whether we, whether we see the fulfillment in our life or not, we know you're going to complete everything you promised. And so we love you and we thank you. We want to go out praising you tonight, Jesus. And we ask all this in your name. Amen.